Hey kids, a fan man coming at you from the fan Manobile. And I had to make this video, I'm sure, from the description. Uh, you went, yeah, the title and description, you thought, yeah, he has to comment on this. Well, lots to talk about. I, I don't really have a whole lot of new insight into it, really, because I, I think everybody is, is pretty clear on, on my views. But I did want to mark the occasion because I do think it is one that that does need to be marked, and I, I think it's a momentous occasion. So it is official now. Uh, if you've not heard, Henry Cavill himself has announced that he is no longer going to portray not so Superman, alternatively known by me as um, Murder Man, uh, Snyder Man, and I also like to call him. Uh, the Hobo of Steel. So, you know, um, which is not... I'm looking at what appears to be a helicopter landing on the street. It's not something I've ever seen. I don't know where it's going in. This is so cool. It's going in... There's a helicopter that's landing on a bank. In the world? That's crazy. I kid you not. It's landing on... Wow. Wow. I, I am I'm sorry that I'm distracted. <laughs> I'm watching this. I should be if I was smart I'd be recording it. Landing on a bank. Eh. That's nothing out of the ordinary. That's nothing nothing to be afraid of there. Um but yes, he's no longer going to play this this twisted caricature of Superman. The first and greatest superhero. And um on a larger scale it also means that the Snyderverse is officially done. Uh, the Snyderverse is done. Patty Jenkins' recent news this past week, two weeks, has said she is not going to be making Wonder Woman 3, which is fantastic. Um, and uh, so it, it, it seems pretty strong now. By the way, Black Adam did not break even. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry to laugh, but I'm also really not, as I'll get into in a moment as to why. Uh, so there's probably not going to be any sequels to Black Adam. This is probably it for Shazam. This is probably going to be it, thankfully, for Aqua Bro. You've probably seen the rumors there uh, that Momoa has said he's been uh, contacted to play a different role. That role, of course, is Lobo. And I know everybody... I, I mean, I've had people who aren't huge comic book fans, but who knew Lobo, who have been saying for years, yeah, Jason Momoa should be Lobo. I don't know. I never really... I like Lobo enough, but he's not somebody that I... I'm like, can't wait to see him in live action, you know? Um, so, anyway, it's looks, it looks like all these pieces of, are falling into place for the end of the Snyderverse. And, um, and, you know, we, of course, have this abomination of a film called The Flash that is, it looks like, will be the last gasp for this horrible, depressing, cynical, dark filth that was the Snyderverse. And so that's going to be gone. That movie will probably finish things off. Uh, it, it seems from everything we've, we've heard and read, you know, over the years and years we've been waiting on this movie. I'm not waiting on it, but I mean that it was supposed to be releasing, that this was intended to be a, a reset of sorts for the Snyderverse to try and, and kind of, you know, repair some elements that, that, are problematic. And as I've said from, from the moment I left the theater, uh, almost 10 years ago now, you cannot build a foundation on sand. And that's being nice and not, not cursing. You cannot build a cinematic universe or any kind of DC universe on a foundation of Superman being a murdering, wandering, aimless thug. Okay, which is what he is in uh, Hobo of Steel, right? <clears throat> He's not Superman, you know. So Henry Cavill has said, "Oh, I'm I'm so honored and happy to play a Superman. Never played Superman, never will play Superman." Okay, the same is true of Batfleck. You know, Ben Affleck has never played Batman, and he never will. He played a murdering, uh, cynical, dark thug allegedly called Batman, who looked like he had been stung by bees and made his suit out of duct tape. 
oh, it's the best live action Batman suit ever. Yeah, I mean, if you think Frank Miller's art is, you know, on, on that particular book is actually quality and you wanted to see that in live action, yeah. Um, so this is all good. And I, I am going to take this moment, yes, to be petty and to celebrate that this just trash. It's, it's you know, the, the best and perhaps the strongest word I can use. Zack Snyder's vision of the of the DC universe is trash. Um, and it has been trash since moment one. So for it to finally be gone is a, is a triumph. And everything it, everything that was part of that, even if he didn't do it directly, trash, okay? Garbage. Um, just has a like veneer of filth on it and, and, and dirt and grime. Kind of like that uh, Hobo of Steel suit, you know? Dark and, and just dirty, dingy, mired in the filth of, of what these cynical men you know, Chris Nolan, David Goyer, and uh, Zack Snyder see humanity as. And that's not Superman, and that's not the DC Universe. So for those who perhaps don't know the comics universes that well, those, those in the general audience, the best example to give you of what these characters really are like is that Marvel situated itself early on as being the universe of realism. The idea was that you were reading about these heroes and it was the world outside your window. No matter where you lived, those characters in the MC, the Marvel Comics universe were going through what you were going through. If you didn't live in New York, it didn't matter because Peter Parker is going through what you're going through. And so forth uh, for all the other heroes, characters there, really. And that's great. And that was a wonderful distinction to make. You know, I think Lee and Kirby and, and, and uh, Ditko and all of those guys, uh, I think were very, it was very smart to do that because they did that, of course, in the early 60s. And um, they, made, they made a universe that reflected the world, the news, the social things going on. Uh, they, they reflected the youth. And that was a nice counterpoint, it was a nice balance to what had happened in the late 50s, right, about 58, when the Silver Age of comics began with DC Comics, right, the return of The Flash. Now, it was a different Flash, right, Barry Allen, but his return was a relaunch of DC Comics as a storytelling uh, machine, if you will, a universe, um, and that's really the rebirth of the DC Universe, the Silver Age of comics for DC. DC's characters and, and the DC universe was a place that was always heightened reality. But it was it was reality to an extent, but at some point, and really we can go, I would say post-Silver Age is, is where it's really perhaps even stronger. We are not seeing the world outside our window because there is no metropolis. It's an idealized form of New York City, but not even New York as it was. Uh, but New York as it could be. Gotham is New York as darker even than it was in its worst times, right? These were idealized representations. They were fantasy representations of reality. And that is how DC Comics distinguished itself from the Silver Age forward and prior, but really that was where they were coming from. And then we had other cities, Coast City, we had Fawcett City, uh, of course, that wasn't D.C. until the 70s, but we had all of these uh, Star City, and we could keep going, right? Um, and all of these are distinctions that made D.C. Comics this different world. It was a different universe than the one that we lived in. And of course, Marvel was too, but Marvel firmly rooting itself in reality in many ways, despite the, the fantasy conventions. Uh, and so, you know, Peter Parker wasn't just going to put on a suit and he wasn't going to just go around and, and, and uh, fight bad guys and then his life was peachy and keen and great. Nor, by the way, was Clark Kent's. And so if you read the Superboy stories and you read Superman stories, really, going back to the Golden Age, Clark Kent's life wasn't peachy just because he was Superman. That's a common misconception. Um, but my point is that DC really was the brighter of the two universes. It was the more fantastical and so there wasn't quite this decision as much to say, well, we're going to go into the psychological depth in the same way that Marvel would do it, right? 
Marvel took that to a new, um, they took a new approach to it. And, and so they distinguish themselves in that way. And that's great. We need those differences. That's why those two universes stood the test of time. And it's why they were always compared to one another and why there, nobody else ever rose above them because they did similar things, but they did them in such different ways that they then themselves became standards for comic book storytelling. And so when we go to the MCU in film, we we saw this world that, yeah, it was real. It's the world outside of our window, but from Iron Man, it was clear this is not real, right? And there was a sense of hope, and there was a sense of optimism, and there was a sense of fantasy, um, even with Thor saying he's not really a god, whatever. You know, he's not a, he's not a mystical being, which I don't care for. But, you know, even in spite of that, this was really more of a DC take. It was an amalgam of, you know, Ultimate Marvel, uh, some of the Marvel Universe as it was in comics, but a heavy dose of DC. And um, we, I attribute that to Kevin Feige being uh, kind of a, a one of, you know, his mentor was, as is Jeff Johns, Richard Donner. So what we, what we see then is a flipping and I, and I think that's certainly, we know there was a brain trust in the MCU. Uh, amazingly enough, Bendis, Mark Miller, some of these guys, Jeff Loeb, um, you know, Favreau, Fagy. But the idea, I have to think somebody said, we're going to make this really, whether consciously or not. But I think some of those guys were absolutely conscious of it. I can tell you Jeff Loeb would be. This is, this is a DC approach because of the, the, the brightness of it, the optimism of it. Um, and that's not really Marvel. I mean, uh, that's there in Marvel, but Marvel's a darker place. And so what the films did, what what the, the films have done since Nolan when it comes to DC is dark, dark, dark realism, 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 which is all fine and good. Like if Chris Nolan had gone to Marvel Studios and he had done, um, let me think, his Iron Man, for example, would be a gritty affair right now it would be it would have some adventure but it would be much darker right um it would be more grounded in realism whereas you look at that first iron man movie and you have you have a lot of superman elements there you know he's got he's enjoying the flight he's enjoying what the armor can do uh tony stark did that in the comics but there was always an edge tony stark's enjoyment of his armor came with that heart right like he had to wear that armor to live kept him alive so there was always that kind of and that was the psychological edge that dc often gave i'm sorry marvel gave in the comics and that was there in the movies yes uh but they removed that pretty quick right the the shrapnel um and and so it is uh it, it it's a, a thing a thing that is um significant to point out my my battery i just got an indicator saying it was going out so I bring all that up. Why? Because the, the Snyderverse was the wrong approach and it was a thoughtless, idiotic, moronic approach. It was a heartless approach. It was soulless. Um, it was deconstruction for the sake of deconstruction made by cynical people who don't like superheroes. They've all admitted, all three have admitted that, right? The three architects of the Snyderverse, all of them admitted, nah, we don't really care for superheroes. In fact, they admitted we're not making a Superman movie. We're making our take on Superman. And the responsibility of anybody working on a project that is a mainstream, large-scale, mass appeal, mass um, reach adaptation must be a faithful adaptation, right? Cannot be a deconstruction. And so that's really, you know, you look at how the MCU did it and you... you look at, at uh, Marvel or, or DC, and DC's never really done that. Now, I, we got somehow, miraculously, we got the, the Donner Superman films, the first one, right? Um, and even even those other films managed to be faithful to Superman. They're, they're you know, not great, but they're iconic Superman films. Um, and, and we can say that we have the, the same for Batman to an extent, but really, you know, we haven't had a faithful Batman film uh, wholly faithful, completely faithful, iconic Batman movie since Mask of the Phantasm. We just, we haven't. You can now, a lot of people are like, no, the Chris Nolan movies were the most faithful Batman movies. If you've never read a Batman comic and you know nothing about Batman, yes, you're right. 
Um, if, if you wanted a poor man's imitation version, like a, uh, you know, um, like an off-brand version of Batman, he's just a ninja in a crime movie, yeah, well, then that's Batman. Sure, sure, sure. Um, but he's not the iconic, that's not the Dark Knight detective guy in the comics, right, who makes everything, who, who's, who's a genius. Um, anyway, this is not a video about that. But my point is that that take finally is gone. So I want to celebrate that. And I noticed that that's most of this video and that that's by design. So that is great news, kids. I've long waited for this day. It is a day that will be long remembered. Um, and so it's, it's wonderful news. And I think the Snyderverse is definitely done. Putting a nail in the coffin, not only the sale um, to, to Discovery, but I, I think definitely this stuff with Ezra Miller. I, I'm very surprised that this film's even coming out. Um, and I think it's only coming out, to be quite honest, because they there is now, I don't even think it's money. I think now there's been so much controversy with Ezra Miller that I think there's a, probably there's going to be an interest to go see this movie, you know, not for the right reasons, but to go see, well, how bad could it be? And, and out of just kind of morbid curiosity, it'd almost be that will people will want to go see it for that reason. So they're going to release it, I think, only for that reason. Um, but they've closed all the other doors that were being planned to be opened. Um, and this was going to be their Hail Mary pass to try to fix the DCU by undoing a lot of things, you know, undoing Hobo of Steel. They were going to bring bad flare rumors, bad Fleck will be back and he's going to be. And, and so now what's happening is uh, James Gunn has, has confirmed that Henry Cavill is not playing Superman. They're doing a Superman film with a younger actor. And guess who's writing it? James Gunn. So here's, so we've talked about the sweet. Let's now talk about the bitter. I am the fan man. I'm not a fanboy who's going to squee. Woohoo. Yay. And then, you know, uh, sit here and, and salivate over more, more, more. Because no, it's not good. Uh, here's the bitter. The bitter thing is that I can't think of anybody really other than Zack Snyder, David Goyer, or Chris Nolan who they could have gotten at Warner Brothers to run their studio, so-called DC Films. I can't imagine anybody worse. Just, I mean, J.J. Abrams, but, you know, uh, I don't count him because he was kind of in there for a time. And here's why, because I'm going to put this first one up, and I'm going to let you think on it. And I'll put a link to a very detailed account of this that I'm very thankful exists, because a lot of people don't want to remember it, talk about it, think about it. But... The first reason I will not support this movie, because I know fans uh, are, are, you know, I know people who watch my content and follow me are going to say, well, Fan Man, if this is an iconic Superman movie, will you watch it? No. Um, and the first reason is this, because James Gunn morally is is a compromised individual. Now, I believe, I don't have any, any he said this, and I believe he's, he's being truthful. He said that he was abused, right, sexually abused, and all of those tweets, hundreds of tweets, joking about pedophilia. Um, and then the connections he has to John Podesta, who's a known pedophile. Um, he's got a lot of connections to troublesome uh, people in terms of, you know, abusing children. And I, I can't find any humor in that. I'm sorry. Um, it, you know, I grew up in a town where uh, there was rampant priest sexual abuse going on. And I watched whole lives destroyed by it. People who took their own life because they couldn't deal with it, right? Whether it was the parents or the children or both in some cases. I find no humor in it. Uh, it's not, I, I joke about just about damn near anything, but I don't see any humor in that. So the, the fact that this guy would think that's funny and joke about it and delete his tweets and then, you know, Disney, Disney fired him only to bring him back because money, what, you know, it was only to, to, to get the press off of them for a time and let that die down. Once it was out of the cycle, they rehired him. The fact that he's getting a job anywhere tells you something about Hollywood. And the fact that there can be people who are excited about what he may do is also troubling. You can't overlook these things. They don't exist in a vacuum. So I will not support anything. And and let's say, right, now this is, I'm seeing it already on the, on the message boards. Didn't take a lot of time, but I'm already seeing it in, in, on social media. Well, He's going to do the Superman movie we've been we've been asking for and deserving. He's what we want. He's finally it's happening. Right. Let's look at his 
just putting aside that element, if you don't put a stock in that for whatever reason, let's look at his resume. He is responsible for Guardians of the Galaxy, two films there. Those are anti-heroes largely, right? They're all largely anti-heroes. Uh, they're, they're lighter anti-heroes, but they're anti-heroes really, nevertheless. You know, they're, they're rogues, anti-heroes. That's not bad per se. They're not on the level of a suicide squad. They're, they're more heroic than anti-heroic, but they've got elements of that. Um, and so then he did a movie, kind of forget the name, but it had Rain Wilson in it, and it had uh, uh, this, you know, she was a lady. Now she apparently isn't a lady somehow. Uh, I don't remember her. I can't think of her name. Somebody will remind me in the comments. Um, who who was uh, a woman back then, you see. And, and Juno, the, the girl at the time, right? Now she believes that she's not. Um, and she, she was in that movie, and it was about a guy who loved comic books, okay? Wanted to become a superhero. Remember Kick-Ass? Kind of like Kick-Ass, except that this guy was a loser. He was portrayed as a loser. Uh, I think he was like a deadbeat dad, if memory serves. I didn't watch it, of course. I read about it. Um, James Gunn wrote and directed this film, uh, I think. And uh, he is ends up killing people, this guy, and is morally, you know, not a hero uh, by any means. And, of course, God forbid uh, you could do something positive with this kind of story. Even Mark Miller couldn't do it positively, right? Um, no, we have to do it cynical and dark and make him a, a you know, just kind of an anti-hero that that woman whose name i'm i'm forgetting who uh I, man i don't ellen ellen page yes yes whatever her she he whatever today she was in that film and she plays a character uh, who who uh falls in love with the rain wilson character and becomes his sidekick and they, they're both you know murder bad guys and then she rapes him you know uh in the that's in the story there and then, of course, he, I don't know how much he wrote, but he, I know he was a producer consultant, and I think his brother co-wrote Brightburn. So kids, uh, Suicide Squad, let's not forget Suicide Squad. James Gunn is the wrong guy to be doing any comic book films. He was wrong for Suicide Squad. Um, Suicide Squad in, in and of itself is not a bad premise, but it's also, as I've said many times, it has to exist in the context of the heroic iconic ideal being set, which it hasn't, right? And so um, he's the wrong person to be running this studio, much less writing a Superman movie, and he says he's writing it. So even if they manage to... it, And by the way, they won't, okay? Let me tell you what his Superman's going to be, and you'll look back in a few years and go, man, fan man psychic. No, I'm just smart, um, and, and, I'm, and I'm not cynical. I'm realistic enough to know what will and won't happen. This will be somehow a tongue-in-cheek kind of, we'll make fun of this as much as we can. We'll be, we'll be very cute about it and, you know, and kind of hip and ironic about Superman. And that's not Superman, right? That's what Donner refused to do, and that's why that movie works so much. That's what every faithful adaptation of any character has done that's been beloved is because it took it seriously. I mean, Adventures of Superman, going back to that with George Reeves takes it seriously, you know, despite the limitations of the budget uh, and, and the time, took it seriously. And that's why that is still uh, a shining beacon when it comes to adaptations of any character, much less Superman. Um, you know, so when you say to me that they're this guy who can't, he doesn't believe in heroism, in true heroism, right? This kind of heroism. He believes in anti-heroism and he believes in kind of mocking heroes and the idea of heroes and doing the right thing. So his Superman is, is not going to be Superman, right? Um, even if it was miraculously the case, right? Because he's writing it and they don't they haven't announced the director. Even if Brad Bird directs this, won't see it. Uh, I will not support this man for all the reasons I've listed, and I won't support anything coming from this new studio. And I know a lot of people were going to say, well, when will it be enough for you? When's it going to be enough? It'll be enough when the mentality from the studio is we are going to do each character the way they are and have been for the bulk of a century and it's not going to be filmmaker first and that's what this is too i've already read the press releases here and there james gunn when they made him the head co-head of the studio his unique vision don't care about anybody's unique vision 
I want these characters faithfully adapted, and then you can put in your your approach to that in the sense of stylistically. But if it's not iconic Superman or Batman or Wonder Woman or it could be Ambush Bug, all right, I don't want to be part of it, and I won't be part of it. Nor should you if you claim to be a fan of these characters. The problem, of course, we know is that many people aren't, you know, and that's the Jane, John and Jane Q general audience isn't, but I'll tell you this, uh, I think they're done. And I think that's why Black Adam underperformed. And I think it's why we're seeing that Snyderverse stuff go. People are tired, I believe, of these kind of nebulous, questionable, morally uh, unsure so-called heroes. They don't want to see a villain do a couple of good things and then become some sort of, you know, rallying point. They want to see heroes. And I'm hoping that that's the case. By the way, that's not what this DC Films is going to be providing. Uh, but they will they will snow uh, the, the general audience enough to make them think that's what they're seeing. And the general audience will probably lap it up because, oh, hey, it's funny. Yeah, it was so funny. Ragnarok was so funny. Yeah, meanwhile, it was a deconstruction of Thor and of heroes in much the same way the Snyderverse was. But ah, it's funny. It was funny and had flashy colors. Yeah. Same was true of the, of the Guardians of the Galaxy films, especially the second one got devolved into very, I thought, very amateurish humor first one has some merit. Um, but at the end of the day, these are the wrong people yet again. And you go, well, geez, when will they get the right people? I'm not putting any hope in it because, um, I, I mean, I don't think they're ever going to get the people that are right. And, um, you know, there's a rumor Comcast is going to buy uh, Warner in a couple of years and, and the DC property with it. Don't Don't know. Maybe a new company will get it. Warner Brothers has consistently, even despite different ownerships has consistently proven they know nothing about how to approach these characters. So I don't have any hope, but this is where my hope is. We went from sweet to bitter. I don't want to end there. I want to eat, end on some more sweet. Kids, these characters are bigger than me. They're bigger than you. They have outlived many of us already, and they will outlive us even if all that is known are the names and the symbols in a few years. But I believe that more will survive, and I believe that we will come to a time, perhaps even darker than the one we know now, where there will be filmmakers, there will be writers, there will be artists who will say, we're going to make these heroes who they are and what they are again, because we need them. We haven't apparently reached that point yet. And we also have people who are bringing in characters to fill that void, since the, the studios, the corporations that own them, don't care. And that gives me hope, and there is hope, there's always hope. And I believe that these characters will, in fact, endure. But they will need the help of folks who really their lives have been shaped by them positively. Many of us grew up in the 80s, and, uh, you know, the parenting style wasn't such that we talked about moral issues. Maybe your parents did, and that's great. Mine, we really didn't get into it. But I had these heroes, Superman, Optimus Prime, He-Man, James T. Kirk, Luke Skywalker, and the list goes on. And I had those characters who guided me, the Ghostbusters even, and, and the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. We could keep going. And they have shaped us. We owe it to them to preserve what they are, what it was that shaped us and gave to us. We need to pass on. And that's where I see the hope. This holiday season, whatever you celebrate, any gifts you give, try to give something to that person that you think might be interested. Go and find a faithful adaptation. It could be animated, it could be a comic book, whatever, a film, give that and tell people this is that character. And uh, don't worry about it being, you know, oh, they'll think it's too old or it's outdated. Tell them, hey, give it a chance and look for the hope in it. Look for the inspiration in it. And I think most people will watch it and enjoy it. And that's what I think we need to do. And that's where the hope is. And another thing is if you go to a place like Books A Million or if you have an Ollie's uh, in your neighborhood, um, there are going to be several discounted trade paperbacks that are quality comic books that you can buy. In fact, I bought a five-pack of comics from 40 years ago, some of these comics, and they were in great condition at Ollie's. I got them for, for $5. F uh, five comics for $5, uh, I think. No, I paid six. But um, that's like 19, 1993 pricing. You know, it's amazing. You go to if you see that at Ollie's, you see that anywhere your local comic shop. Buy that and give that to a kid and say, "Hey, these are these are these heroes. These are these characters that have 
that's who you're even hearing about now or seeing in a film, a video game, it's because of this. You know, maybe it's a faithful video game. Give, give that to somebody. But don't give your money to support what you know is not a faithful adaptation. Um, put your hope in that because that universal human truth of goodness, heroism, selflessness, nobility, respect for life, respect for all people, self-sacrifice, all of that is encapsulated in these iconic, mythical, universal heroes. And it's up to you and me to preserve them and to pass them on. And I have my hope in that. Thanks so much for watching, kids. Stay safe, stay super, and to all of you, Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays.